morning church. Welcome to our worship service this morning. Last week I quoted from Psalm 118. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I shared with you my challenge to myself to find the joy in each and every day, even if uh, it really is quite small. And today Psalm 100 continues that challenge to be joyful to come before the Lord with praise. We recognise that sometimes it's easy to praise and sometimes it's hard. The Bible talks about our praise being a sacrifice and so we come. We come before the Lord with our ups and our downs, whatever our circumstances, whatever our feelings, and we bring our sacrifice of praise to God. Listen to the words of Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Wonderful, wonderful words there. And now Jan is going to lead us in our first song that reminds us that we are gathered, albeit digitally, but we're gathered to praise God. We are here for you. Thanks, Jan. Good morning, church. It's another Sunday and we're here to worship our Lord. As you may have noticed, I'm actually standing up today, not sitting down, because I really do feel this song requires me to stand um, to be able to move around. Um, so let's lift our praise to our Lord as we sing. Let our praise be your welcome, because we are here for him. Let's sing, church. Thank you.
Let every heart adore, let every soul awake. Lord, this morning I hope we just take in what it is you need us to hear. As June brings the word, Lord, may we absorb it and may we be changed by it. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Amen. Some notices for us this morning, church. At the end of our service today, uh, we're going to join together as usual uh, in our Zoom room. If you would like to join us and you don't have the link, just message me, text me, email me right now and I'll send that straight through to you. It is the link that we use every single Sunday, so if you've had it before, you should just be able to click on it and get in. Hopefully the problems that we had last week have been resolved. Just to say a quick thank you. Um, before we went into lockdown at our members meeting, we spoke to you about our financial situation, about the fact that we are running a deficit. We asked if you would consider increasing your giving. We asked if you would consider giving, switching your giving to online uh, so that we can claim the gift aid on that uh, and everything that's involved with that. I just want to say a huge thank you because so many of you have done that. However, we are not out of the woods. Um, this is a really difficult time and financially it's a really difficult time for the church. Um, rather than reducing our deficit, currently as you can imagine it is increasing as there is no income from room hire, room rental and our giving and our cash offerings uh, that we would usually take in our service each week obviously isn't happening. So I just want to take uh, a minute to just um, ask you now that if you do currently give through a cash offering usually into our offering that's passed around, would you consider uh, either switching your giving to online um, and if you want information on that just speak to me or to our treasurer or to Sue, uh, so that's absolutely fine and, and myself or Ian or Sue will talk you through that. Alternatively, if you're not confident with online banking, it's not something you want to do. Maybe you want to, instead of, uh, as, as we join together on a Sunday, instead of putting your offering into the offering bag, maybe put it into an envelope, maybe put it into um, a, a tin can or a jar or whatever. And you could consider either posting that through to the church so that that can go into our bank, or just letting the treasurer know that you're doing that, that you are doing that each week and so that we can count that towards uh, our financial situation. But I just want to say a huge, huge thank you uh, to those that are just being so faithful in their giving through these difficult times. And just to say that, thank you for everything that you're doing. And if for you things are really tight right now, then you don't have to do anything. In fact, let us know and we'll bless you. We don't want anyone to go without. If you're struggling right now, you let us know and we will help you and bless you and support you as a church family. Thank you. Jenny is going to lead us in our prayers this week. But just to say that on the day that Jenny recorded it, there was a serious accident in Southwell outside the doctor's surgery uh, where someone lost their life. And so we add to our prayers. We pray for those who are mourning and grieving that loss this week. We also pray for the person who was driving the car that was involved in the accident. And for anyone who has been affected by this terrible accident. We lift them to the Lord. And ask Lord in your mercy, hear our prayers. And now. It's over to Jenny. Good morning, SBC. I was sitting in the garden yesterday and uh, I was reading. Uh, and I glanced up and there was this bird soaring across the sky. Beautiful blue sky uh, and it was exploring the freedom that it had. And as I watched it, uh, it flew towards the trees and my eye was caught by um, the Copper Beach. Such a lovely deep colour in amongst all the green of the other trees and it just drew my thoughts to our creator God to the beautiful world that he has made for us uh, and that uh, 
it just lifts your heart in praise. So let's begin our prayer time this morning by, by giving praise to God. Dear Lord and Father God, we thank you for this beautiful world that you've created. We thank you, Lord, for all the precision. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the variety that we have. We thank you, Lord, the evidence of your love is there in all that you have created. So we come to you this morning with our hearts full of praise and gratitude for who you are, for what you have done. And we thank you for your love that you have poured out on each one of us. And Lord, we just want to say thank you, Lord, praise you, Lord, and to give you all the glory. Amen. I'm also very aware that uh, we might be praising a creator God and our hearts may be light, but there are many people who um, their hearts aren't light today. They're uh, finding times difficult, uh, uh, even dark. Uh, so I just want to think about other people as we think about those who are having difficulties during uh, the COVID-19 situation. So let's let's pray together for others. Dear Lord and Father God, just pray for those who are sick today, for those who uh, are suffering ill health. And Lord, we just lift them before you. We pray for those who uh, have had their operations cancelled, their treatments delayed, uh, and who don't know uh, when these things are going to happen again. Lord, we pray for all those in those situations, particularly for those of our fellowship, uh, who are putting on a brave face uh, but are finding things really difficult. We pray, Lord, for your love to surround them. We pray, Lord, that uh, you will give them hope, that, Lord, you will take away uh, the fear and the anxiety that accompanies these things and replace it with a sense of your peace and your presence for them. Lord, we just pray for the frontline workers this morning who day by day uh, faithfully go out to work uh, regardless of the dangers that face them. Lord, we pray your protection on them. We just pray, Lord, that uh, you'll be with them as they work uh, and that, Lord, you will use them in that sphere to bring light and help and hope uh, to those who they work with. And Lord, we think too of those who've been bereaved recently, uh, especially the two families in our church who uh, have funerals happening this week. We pray, Lord, for a sense of your peace and your presence with them, that, Lord, you will strengthen them, that, Lord, when they look back, they will see that you have carried them through this time, that you have never left them, uh, that, Lord, you have constantly been with them, upholding them. So, Lord, we just pray for your peace for them today. Lord, for those who are facing unemployment or financial difficulties and uh, who don't know what the future holds. We pray that you will take away the fear and the anxiety that's clouding them, that Lord, you will replace it with your peace, with a sense of hope, uh, that Lord, they will uh, feel your love surrounding them too. And Lord, we pray for our missionaries today, working in really difficult circumstances uh, in a land that's uh, not their homeland. Lord, we pray that they will know that uh, they may be far away from, from family and friends, but they're not far away from you. So, Lord, we pray that uh, you will protect them in their work, that you will give them wisdom as they seek to spread your word. They seek to help others uh, under difficult circumstances. Lord, we pray that uh, you will give them that peace that only comes from you that sense of your love, that sense of your presence, uh, that Lord, you will give them joy in the work that they do and they will see fruit for their labours. Dear Lord, we just pray for our government at this time, for all the difficult decisions that have to be made day by day. Just pray, Lord, for your wisdom. Just pray that, uh, Lord, you will guide them in the decisions that they have to make, that, the, Lord, they will make the right decisions. So, oh Lord, we just pray that uh, you will be strongly with them as they meet. And dear Lord, we just pray for ourselves. Just pray, Lord, for this morning, that uh, as we listen to your word, that it will come fresh and new to us. 
that Lord you will speak powerfully to it that Lord we will have receptive hearts just to hear what you are saying to us today uh, and to strengthen us for the coming week so Lord we just ask all these things in and through your name Amen Sam is going to lead us now as we sing praise to our God and we declare again our trust in him from those wonderful famous words of Psalm 23 the Lord's my shepherd I will trust in you thank you Sam my shepherd I will not want He makes me lie in pastures green He leads me by the still, still waters His goodness restores my soul And I will trust trust in you alone for your endless mercy follows me your goodness will lead me home he guides my way Some of us find technology easy and for some of us it's definitely more of a challenge but even if you're not great with technology if you do want to be involved in our services in any way then do let me know and uh, we'll work out a way to do it um, and so this morning Dave Driscoll is going to bring us our reading and so if you have your Bibles will you please turn to Isaiah chapter 41 and Dave is going to read to us starting at verse 8. In church, lovely to see, well here, well be with all of you even remotely and uh, I hope we will all meet together very soon in person. Our reading today is from Isaiah chapter 41 and we are reading verses 8 to 14. So that's Isaiah 
chapter 41, verses 8 to 14. And I'm reading from the NIV. But you, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, O worm Jacob, O little Israel, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Thanks, Dave. Uh, this week, we're continuing our series on Isaiah, and we get today to some really, really wonderful words. Uh, but they're words that we really do need to understand and understand properly. Otherwise, they become well, worse than meaningless. They can become trite. They can become wishful thinking or almost an incantation or something like that. And that's definitely not what they are. So we really need to look at these passages. Now, I know how much you've missed our history lessons since we can't meet in church. So I've brought them back. I've resurrected them, if you like. And here's our first history lesson. I should get maybe a flashing warning on the screen or something that so you can put the kettle on if you're not interested in history. But honestly, you really, really should be. We're not exactly certain when these verses, you see, when these passages, Isaiah uh, 41 and such, uh, when they were written. I said last week that Isaiah is generally divided into three sections. Most people agree on that. This part one is from Isaiah chapter one to chapter 39. And that's written as a warning to the people. Uh, they're disobeying God, they're turning away from him, they're disregarding him. And Isaiah is warning them that this is going to have real and severe consequences. God is gonna remove his hand of protection from them and they will be taken into exile. And geographically, uh, Israel sits in a fabulous position. I don't know if you're aware, it's part of that fertile crescent that is surrounded by desert. Uh, and above you, you've got the superpowers of Assyria and Babylon or Persia. And below, you have Egypt. And I always kind of think of the opening credits of Dad's army, you know, with the, the arrows moving over the land backwards and forwards as the army moves forward. Well, poor little Israel is always under threat from arrows coming up from Egypt or down from Assyria or over and down from Babylon. And in part one, in Isaiah part one, chapters one to 39, Isaiah is basically telling them this is what's going to happen. This is what is going to happen. And then we get to part two of Isaiah, which is Isaiah from chapter 40 until chapter 55. And part two of Isaiah is written to the people in exile. The worst has happened. The unthinkable has happened. But actually, has it? Because we don't actually know when this was written. Some people think that the whole of Isaiah was written at the same time. Uh, that the first part of Isaiah is, is the prophet telling the people they're going to exile. But then before they go into exile, they're told that this won't be forever, that God will still be with them in their troubles, that he hasn't given them over and all of those things that we thought about last week. Other people believe that this part of Isaiah, the part from uh, 
chapter 40 to chapter 55 was actually written by a second prophet but uh, under the school under the name of Isaiah uh, written to the people once they were in exile to tell them that their troubles would be coming to an end you know dust off your blue passports you're going home the thing is if you ask two Bible scholars you'd get two different answers because we just don't know what the answer is and the main reason for the difference of opinion is a very important man it's a man called King Cyrus now Cyrus is king of Persia and while Israel are in exile to Babylon Persia then surge and rise in power and they come and they defeat Babylon and all of a sudden you know uh, horrible King Nebuchadnezzar is gone and now Cyrus is king and Cyrus is mentioned by name by the prophet Isaiah and if we believe that the whole of Isaiah was written at one time by one person then we have to believe that Isaiah mentions King Cyrus by name around 150 years before he was actually born so you can see that's why there's this difference of opinion and then the third part of Isaiah verses 56 to 66 talk to the people as they are returning and as they have returned to their land but as I said last week it's the second part of Isaiah that we're particularly interested in right now these are the words written to the people while they were going through the toughest time of their lives one of the toughest times of the history of Israel as a people and as a nation a time when God's chosen people had been defeated and they felt that God had abandoned them the God of their history the God who called them out of nothing the God who called them to be a people the God of Abraham of Isaac and of Jacob was he still their God and as we read these words spoken to them words that speak through the years to us words of God's faithfulness and love and promise and hope you have to really understand what the people were going through because you see there are some daft Christians about there are Christians who take the words of the Bible completely out of their context and then they go around and they declare them and they claim them and all sorts of things and then when trouble comes knocking on their door when terrible things happen when they catch this coronavirus or when they lose their job or when they lose a loved one or things don't go their way well then their faith in God is dented or their faith in the Word of God is damaged and that's why history is important that's why I've taken the time to point out all of the context that these uh, passages are written in because if we were to just read these words out of their context we could be justified in thinking that that's what they are saying you know don't ever be afraid I the Lord am with you your enemies cut they're gonna be ashamed they will be as nothing and perish no trouble will ever come near you but as we now know, that's wrong. And the reason that's important is because if we misunderstand these words, if we misuse them, if we mishandle the word of God, then they stop being words of deep comfort and hope and they actually start being words that can cause pain and guilt and hurt. How do these words speak to someone with a terminal illness how do these words of hope speak to someone who's lost a loved one how do they speak to someone who's in danger of losing their livelihood and everything that they own because their business has been forced to close right now how do these words speak to the person in an abusive relationship who is in lockdown with their abuser how do they speak to you when you are really struggling and really low see if we misunderstand them if we misuse them they just add guilt to hurt and pain that is already there so what does it really mean to not fear and not be dismayed when it feels like your whole world is caving in 
The other thing we need to realise as we come to the Bible, as we come each week, week by week to hear these sermons, we need to realise that each passage is not a standalone story. Each chapter continues on from the previous one. This passage continues on from everything that was built on last week. In chapter 40, we heard last week how the prophet reminded the people that God is an awesome God, that God doesn't compare to idols. How can you compare the one who created the heavens and the earth to something that you carve out of a lump of wood? And again in this chapter, God says to the people, bring your idols, bring them out. Let's ask them how they can save you. Let's see how they foretold all of this that you're going through. And let's see how they are going to redeem you and rescue you. Because you see, that's what God is going to do. Our God is a redeeming God. He's in the business of redemption. He's a God of rescue. And that picture of redemption, that picture of rescuing his people, well, that's the overarching theme of the whole of Scripture. We see it in the redemption of, from slavery in Egypt. We see it here in the promise of redemption from their exile. And ultimately, we see it in the death and the resurrection of Jesus, redeeming his people from sin and death to eternal life and to the hope of glory. And the overriding theme of this whole chapter, of this whole chapter, is grace. The pure, unmerited, undeserved grace of God. You see, the people, the people, they've turned their back on God. They've disregarded him. They've put their hope and their faith in idols. They've put their hope and their faith in the work of their own hands rather than in God. And now they're in trouble. And yet we saw last week, the prophet says to the people, don't think that God has forgotten you. Don't think that he's turned his face away from you. And that message is carried on and it's amplified in our passage today. Those wonderful, wonderful words in verses 8 to 10. But you, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant, I have chosen you and I have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. See, Israel might have been unfaithful to God, but he has not been unfaithful to them. They might have broken their promises, their side of the covenant, but God hasn't. He chose them, he called them by name, and they're his. And those words are for us today as well whatever situation, whatever circumstance, whatever you're going through, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and uphold you with my righteous right hand. Today you might be listening to this online because maybe you once used to come to SBC or maybe you used to go to another church, but that was then. And you've wandered away from God and Maybe you've turned your back on him. Well, hear his words to you today. I have chosen you. I have not rejected you. So if today God feels a long way away, if he feels distant, if you feel lost and abandoned, hear his words to you today. I have chosen you. I have not abandoned you. See, our God is a God of overwhelming love, mercy and of grace. And he's a God who is awesome and mighty and holy. And yet he holds out his hand like a father waiting for a child to place our hand in his. He says, I'm the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear. I will help you. And so this morning whatever situation you find yourself in. God wants to redeem you and rescue you. He hasn't forgotten you. You are his precious chosen child. He called you, he knows you, he loves you, and he's holding his hand out to you. Will you put your trust in him? 
Will you trust him to hold you and lead you and bring you through? Or will you trust in your own ability to get through? Your own ability to make things work, your own ability to stand on your own two feet. He's holding his hand out to you. And you know what? You might be thinking, but I tried that once. I tried that and God let me down. Oh, you might be thinking, you know what? I've messed up. God can't possibly still be holding out his hand to me. Well, he is. He loves you and he has called you. And just before we finish, um, I just want to pick out a couple more verses for us this morning that are the beginning of ideas that we will explore more and explore more deeply in further weeks. But these are fabulous words of hope for his people and for us. In verse 17, God speaks of people being desperate for water in the desert, being parched and thirsty. And he promises to make rivers and springs and pools of water for them to bring the dead places back to life. And you see, so often in the Bible, the image of water is used as a picture of the Holy Spirit. You know, God is the one who is able to bring those dead places back to life. So if you're feeling parched, if you're feeling dry, if the tender flower of your faith is withering, if your circumstances or your situation have left you feeling as if you're wandering around the desert, hear these words of promise. Because to the woman at the well, Jesus promises springs of living water. At the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, he promises anyone who believes in him, springs of living water will flow from within them. See, this isn't just God promising to be with us in our troubles, but it really is a picture of hope for the future, for our heavenly future and also for our earthly future. He can and will breathe new life into a parched and barren land, into our broken world into his broken people. And so God, we pray as we sang earlier, let your word move in power. Let what's dead come to life. The promise of his Holy Spirit is for you, whatever your situation, whatever your circumstance. So put your hand in his, renew your trust and your faith in him, and he will breathe new life into you. Streams of living water will flow from you. So this morning I want to leave you with these wonderful words. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Shall we pray? Father God, we just thank you this morning for your faithfulness to us. That even when we turn away from you, you never turn away from us. And Father, I pray that we again will reach out and put our hand into yours, into the hand of the Father who loves us and who knows us and who has called us by name. We pray now for those who need to know that love of the Father, those who need to experience your love and your grace and your forgiveness, whether for the first time or for the millionth time. Thank you that you are the God of the second chance, that there's always another chance with you because you never, ever give up on us. And so God, as this lockdown continues, will you calm our fears? Will you hold us tight and will you lead us on through the power of your Holy Spirit? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we're going to sing now that wonderful song wonderful song, Amazing Grace.
and so church shall we bless one another with the words of the grace may the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with us all evermore amen amen see you shortly uh, in our zoom chat for uh, bring your own biscuits